Welcome to the Intimate Marriage Podcast, where I teach educated, successful couples how to have incredible, passionate relationships so that you can stop compromising and start feeling fully alive in your relationship. I'm Alexandra Stockwell, aka The Intimacy Doctor. I'm a physician, a relationship and intimacy coach, and I'm an intimate marriage expert. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. We have four children and full professional lives, and we've created an amazing marriage. I've shown hundreds of couples how to do so as well. So if you want to deepen your understanding of your own relationship and learn to access new heights of emotional, sensual, and erotic intimacy, you're in the right place. I will show you how. Now, let's dive in. Welcome to what is sure to be a remarkable conversation on the Intimate Marriage Podcast. It is distinct from every other episode before in a few ways. One of them is that my guest is an individual who is not partnered. I haven't interviewed anyone before unless they were on the show with their partner or had a long-term relationship which informed our conversation regardless of what topic we discussed. However, with me today is Serdar Hararovich, but let's hear it in your beautiful voice. Say your name, please. It's Serdar Hararovich. Well, there you have it. So no matter what we talk about, it's going to be a good conversation to hear that voice. And I've invited Sirdar here because I follow you on Facebook. And the reason I follow you on Facebook is I heard you speak on a panel about the intricacies and harm done in the context or under the banner of masculine feminine polarity. I don't really want to get into that particularly right now, but I'm just telling you the context. And I really appreciated the depth and the breadth and the nuance with which you speak. And then I saw a post you did about how to have meaningful connected sex. And I invited you on the show. So, that's where I'm starting. I'd love for you to say whatever you want people to know about who you are and how you serve in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's really wonderful to, um, you know, have this opportunity to share a little bit more. And you, you mentioned the word nuance there. And I think that kind of, uh, sums up what I'm intending to bring into the conversations that I see and why I've felt inspired to share in the way that I do, because I see a lot of uh, oversimplification of conversations and topics. And, you know, it's a, it's a competitive marketplace out there with people trying to, you know, uh, reduce things into their most simple components. And what I find is that I have clients coming to me and they're, um, they're confused with all these different messages that are out there about how to relate with each other. Um, you know, they're trying to do have boundaries and they're struggling with how to do that in a way that's enhancing their relationships rather than creating more disconnect. Um, they're taking on these beliefs about how they're supposed to be either as women or as men and what my greatest value is connection. And what I find is that all these different messages and belief systems that are being spread, they're actually going against connection. Then they're, they're making connection more challenging. People are feeling more disconnected from themselves. They're feeling like uh, they need to be a certain way in order to have uh, authentic and fulfilling relationships. And so, this is why I felt inspired to start writing and sharing more of my perspectives, because what I have found is by 
really embodying more of who I am and doing the trauma work and working through all of these beliefs that I had taken on, that's what's given me the most fulfilling and nourishing relationships in my life. It's not by taking on these uh, simplified ideas about how to be and who to be and then trying to relate from that place. So, um, and I, as a bit of context for why connection is such a huge value for me, I grew up uh, as a first generation immigrant here in Australia and my parents didn't really have the capacity to be there for me emotionally in the ways that I needed. And so there was emotional neglect, there was trauma, and it left me, you know, deeply, on the one hand, deeply disconnected from my authentic self because I didn't have that mirroring from others. And it also meant that I had this yearning for connection and a yearning that had, was not met until uh, a few years ago, which came from one, you know, reconnecting with my own self and doing the therapeutic work to do that but also how to bring that authentic self into connection with other people. Um, so because of my background, that's kind of what's highlighted for me, the, the power of connection and how beautiful and rewarding it can be to really connect on that soulful level with another human being. And um, that's what drives me. And so when I see stuff out there that seems to make it even, or to add to the shadow that a lot of people are carrying, whether it's shame about who they are or a disconnection from their authentic self, um, that drives me to you know speak on those topics and share a little bit more of the nuances that I feel can add and help people to connect more deeply with each other. Thank you so much for that. There are many different ways in which I want to respond, but just right off the bat, I want to affirm you on your journey and acknowledge the affirmation I receive on mine because you and I have lived completely different lives. I've been married for 26 years. I have four children. Uh, all but one of my great grandparents were born in the United States. You've described your life. And yet, I think more than anybody else on the internet, I feel kinship, resonance, and connection, I'll say, with what you post, even though you're addressing people different than the people that I'm addressing, that truth still really pulses for me. And I'll add that I feel that coaching couples in long-term relationships. I sometimes coach people who are single or early in their relationship, but for the most part, I'm working with couples who are married or otherwise committed, who've been together for at least five years. And there's something in those long-lasting relationships which keeps things honest in a way that when you're coaching people who are dating or trying out this role or that role, you can live with the delusion and the oversimplification and consider it successful a lot longer than someone who's created a life and waking up in the same bed with someone for 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And you see that those you know, simplifications, whether it's from Disney or from new age relationship experts or anyone else, they really don't go deep enough for the connection to actually be felt and then blossom. And with that, I'd like to pivot <laughs> and go ahead and read the bio that you sent me because it just enhances what you've said, which is as an authentic intimacy coach, Serdar Hararovich supports his clients to step beyond the mask we all learn to wear and experience the soulful depths of true intimacy. Teaching healthy communication skills, clear boundaries and tools to co-create emotional safety. He helps you to start feeling truly seen, 
heard, and cherished for who you are by deepening your connection to yourself and to others. Before I go further in the direction I had intended, I'd love to ask you to speak on trauma. That is a word which is definitely used. It's trendy in relationship coaching contexts. As a physician, I'm very clear on trauma, like the kind where you need a level three trauma facility, where you need surgery, where things are happening very quickly. Then there's also the trauma that one doesn't even realize a traumatic event occurred, except it results in a stuckness repeatedly. This is just an area where a lot of people have a lot of assumptions. And I wonder if you'd bring your view. What do you mean when you say trauma? Mm, mm, yeah, thank you for that question, because I think it is important to clarify that. And there are different kinds of trauma, as you said. And the kind of trauma that is most relevant to the type of work that I do with um, w helping people with their relationships and dating and their relationship with themselves is what's called attachment trauma. And this also overlaps with developmental trauma or childhood trauma. But attachment trauma is uh, specific in that it's relating to the connection that we have or the bond that we have as children to our caregivers and attachment trauma relates to that bond being impaired in some way or not forming in a healthy way and that can include lots of things that people don't classify as trauma so neglect emotional neglect would be uh, ongoing emotional neglect would be classified as attachment trauma it's an experience which impairs that bond, which is so important to our development as human beings and to our ability to connect with others in a healthy way. So attachment trauma can also be uh, not feeling a sense of knowing who you are because it hasn't been mirrored to you. There wasn't enough attention or attunement to you as a child because your parents didn't have enough time to do that, for example, or they were busy or they had their own trauma and so they didn't have the skills to be able to uh, offer that. Uh, and it can also in include uh, either real or perceived abandonment experiences as a child. And so attachment trauma is, um, that's the kind of trauma that I'm usually speaking to uh, when I'm talking about trauma. Okay, so if there is a couple and they've been together for 15 years and she feels isolated within the relationship, even though if someone were following them around and taking a video, it would look like everything that was happening was indicating a healthy, wholesome, typical marriage. But inside, she feels lonely in that marriage of apparent connection. Will you just speak to that as an example to anchor in what you've shared? Uh, sure. So uh, do you want me to go into that example as um, something, uh, as an example to analyze what could be going on there from the perspective of attachment trauma? Or Well, mostly what I'm thinking is, if someone is listening and your relationship, your primary intimate relationship is other than fantastically nourishing and satisfying and growth oriented and fertile, if it's anything besides that, how does someone listening, recognizing the wisdom in what you've shared, know if what's happening is attachment trauma being expressed or not? That's really what was driving my presenting you with an example? What's a question someone might ask or a way of relating to lived phenomenon to know if what you're saying is really the next place to put attention in order to have more joy, more connection, more purpose, and more fulfillment in life and relationship? 
I would say in most cases, attachment trauma would be a factor in uh, an experience of that kind. Uh, and one of the questions that someone could ask is, does this feeling feel familiar? And so if that feeling of uh, being in connection with someone but feeling lonely, it, does that feeling feel familiar to you in some way? Is it something that you've experienced before? And so if that, if the answer is yes, and usually it will be yes, because people are often playing out there what they're used to or what's called their internal working model of attachment in their adult relationships. So what they got used to, their blueprint of love um, is often something that they experience later in life as well. And so that question can kind of t start to tie um, those things together. Is this is this a feeling that's familiar to me in some way? Is this a, or is this a repeating or reoccurring experience for me? Has it happened before? Beautiful. One of the ways that I approach that is I'll ask a client, how old do you feel? And often when one of these feelings of loneliness or feeling unseen or frustration or whatever the flavor is, they don't always know what age it feels like, but it's very clear that they don't feel like their mature biological age. And that, for me anyway, is not about going and hunting for the stimulus. It's just understanding that when you feel that way, you're a child with needs, at least in some aspect of your soul, and then you can decide how you navigate that accordingly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I went looking for the Facebook post of yours that I read about how to have incredible, meaningful, nuanced, expressive, nurturing sex. And it was posted like pinned. I didn't know you could pin things on Facebook, but it was pinned. And I went looking for it again, because after I read that, I invited you to this conversation and it, I didn't find it again, but I found a different one that I'm going to read. But any way in which you want to take the conversation into how this really plays out in sex, I would love for anyone listening to take something from our conversation, not just the flavor, but even something specific that they can take into the next time they have sex. That's, that's my hope. But I want to read something that I did find on your Facebook feed today, which is, a man may be attracted to a beautiful woman, but his deepest love will be reserved for the woman who his heart feels safe and seen with. I think that's something that as women in heteronormative relationships, we want to be true. But there's a lot in society that makes us question that. So I wonder if you would just expand on how that's a reality for you. I think, you know, we can acknowledge uh, different realities, including the reality that, um, you know, we are biological creatures and we're driven by emotions and the drive to procreate and, and have sex with uh, people who are attractive and who we consider beautiful. And that's something that we see and, you know, it's there. And what that um, post is getting to is something a little bit deeper there. And so while that is true, what, my personal experience as a man has been is, you know, I used to do a lot of casual dating and uh, have sex with many women. And um, that was my looking at it. Uh, subsequently, what that was about for me was I was looking for connection, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what real connection is about because it, had, it wasn't taught to me. It wasn't part of my blueprint. What do you do after that? You know, it just wasn't part of my experience. And so I was constantly searching for this uh, connection that I was yearning for. Uh, and sex was the closest approximation to that. It was an experience where I got to be with a woman, to feel connected with her, to feel her softening into uh, the experience with me and feeling seen in that 
feeling appreciated and feeling connected, you know, physically. There's, and there's an there's a attunement that happens, you know, to have good sex. We're tuning to each other. So that was the closest thing that I knew to deep, meaningful connection. Uh, but what I have found subsequently is, as wonderful as that is, what oh, after um, having that enough and starting to learn how to actually connect with people on a deeper level has given me so much more fulfillment. And now what I look for is not, you know, who's the most beautiful or attractive person, but who can I feel that sense of a deeper uh, sense of being seen and appreciated and connected with on this, on this level of uh, presence and heart and soulfulness and that's what i find so much more nourishing and rewarding now and so the part of me that likes attractive women isn't gone but there's this new part of me that is awakened which is a recognition of what can be so much more fulfilling than what i was used to and the only way i knew how to have connection and so um what that means is and this is why I speak about emotional safety because it's something that isn't spoken of um, a lot, or at least I don't see it being spoken of much, especially as it relates to a man's need for emotional safety. But that's what I needed in order to enter this space of feeling more connected with a woman, to actually feel like I, who I am, is safe with this woman. That's what allowed me to start to open my heart more because if I feel safe, then my heart starts to feel a sense of peace and a sense of uh, it's okay for me to be here more fully. And when I'm here more fully in the, in the connection with a woman, then I'm feeling more seen and more appreciated for who I am. And that's opening up this space for this deeper recognition, this deeper uh, sense of feeling really connected with a person on that deeper level. And that for me, is so much more rewarding. When that's connected with, you know, good sex and connected sex, that's the most, you know, deeply rewarding experience I can have. And so that's what I have found, that sense of feeling more emotionally safe with a woman, which is both my responsibility to learn how to do that for myself, what kind of conversations I can have in order to create that emotional safety, and then being, and then giving her the opportunity to meet me in that space, and um, so that's what I'm speaking to in, in that post. Yeah, and I'm glad you answered that way because it reminded me that one of the things about the post that I didn't find that I had originally read was that you talked about an invitation to have sex with a very beautiful woman, and you declined because you couldn't feel her heart. I'm not sure if that's exactly how you put it, but it's very related to what you're saying. And it's bringing to mind something which may sound very mundane and pedestrian, but I offer it to listeners actually with equal depth to what you just shared. And that is that the very first couple that I coached, this was in 2013, it was, of course, a very big deal for this couple to bring a third person into the intimacy of their lasting relationship. And I knew how to create rapport and appropriate connection as a coach. And she spoke with him in the way she spoke with him when no one was around. And I, I knew them, I knew them to care and be very committed and loving, upstanding people. And she spoke with him with such disrespect is really the best way I can say it. I was just kind of astonished at how she didn't see his capabilities and spoke to him in a way that reflected that. And I was actually even more surprised that he just took it. And I realized, oh, this is normal. This is how this communication goes. And literally a nanosecond later, I realized, oh, that's how I talk to my husband. And seeing that mirrored in how she spoke with him, it was more the tone of voice than anything else. 
about, well, he wouldn't be able to do that or something like that. And it really opened up for me what was a massive blind spot because I considered myself skillful in relationships and I began to understand when my husband pulled away, it wasn't because he was being a jerk or incapable. It was a direct response to, I don't mean sexually pulled away, although I could, but I really mean just emotionally closed down. It was a direct response to how I was treating him. And I often am talking about taking personal responsibility, and that can be a very confusing concept, but it's what I mean when I describe noticing that I was being disrespectful to my husband and creating outcomes that I blamed him for. And so I really appreciate how you speak about what you do to be able to have a relationship like this, and also then the invitation you provide for a woman. And I'm someone who I suppose provided that invitation for my husband, but I've never quite thought about that that way. I look forward to him listening and having a conversation, listening to our conversation, and then I'll have one with him. But for a man who really resonates with what you've said and wants to create this, what is something that he can ask or be or say to his woman as an invitation, not about whether or not they're going to have sex together, because I'm talking to couples who are in committed relationships, but to evoke more of the emotional safety. Mm. Uh, that's a great question. And I think it would depend on the circumstance for each man and the relationship and where it's at. Um, but often what you spoke to there, I think, is relevant to this. You spoke to that experience that people can have of where they're used to being spoken to in a particular way. And they're used to a level of contempt or disrespect in their relationship and in the way that they're communicated with. And so for some men, it's about awakening to that realization that that doesn't have to be that way. And regardless of what's been happening, we to know that you're allowed to have standards in your relationship and how you're spoken to and that it's very common for people to get used to being spoken to in these ways and for it to just become the norm in their relationships because a lot of men experience that as children they experience being blamed or being made wrong in some way and so they can go into relationships and when that dynamic increases or intensifies over time it's just something that they get used to so coming back to the realization that it doesn't have to be that way though there may be reasons why that's playing out and there may be um you know things for him to take responsibility for to be able to acknowledge for example if um you know he's agreeing to do things that he doesn't have the capacity to do or the intention to do because he's already feels like he's overgiven um, or he's at his capacity to so the first step is usually usually to um take stock of that experience and come into that uh, awareness of you're allowed to have a boundary there or a new standard and you can do that in a collaborative way you can you know for example if if it's a case where um you know this dynamic has been playing out for a while where there's been uh communication where he's been feeling blamed i would um just as a general uh way of approaching it i would start by acknowledging it and say hey you know i'm noticing that over time we our communication has developed into this uh you know place of blame and defensiveness and i just want to acknowledge that that's happening and I'm feeling a desire to look at if ways of being able to change that and shift that because it doesn't feel like it's serving us to be in that place. So how do you feel about us looking at this and starting to work on what's going on there and, and creating some new standards and agreements about how we speak to each other? 
So that would be the first way I would go about that is to just um, bring it up, acknowledging that something's happening instead of ignoring that it's happening, um, and then start by using that collaborative approach uh, that's neither blaming his partner for it, but acknowledging that there is a dynamic there and let's see if we can start to work on that together. That's beautiful. And I will say that my clients who are include a lot of good men, it would be terrifying to have that conversation. So I just want to add a little bit that if this is something you'd like to do, I recommend you write it down as a letter and sit with it and revise it, consider how it's going to land for your woman. And then you literally can say, I've written something down that I was nervous to say, and I wanted to be able to be careful with my words, and I'd like to read it to you. And the other thing that I would encourage is to clarify what you want or don't want in a response. In other words, I'd love for you to just hear this and then let's talk about it. Or I'd love for you to hear this and then tell me if it feels that way to you too. Or I'd love for you to hear this and then let's just be quiet together for a moment. I mean, I'm making this up. This is not an exhaustive list, but I'm encouraging anyone who wants to do this to really consider what you want to happen after you've made your communication and convey that before you make it so that you really set things up for a win-win and you don't make this vulnerable, tender, heartfelt, significant communication. And then because it's so new to do that, neither one of you know how to navigate that and you fall into the old patterns. You want to prevent that and really have it move in a new direction. I ask all of my guests, I begin by saying that I believe that intimate relationships are the ultimate vehicle for personal growth. And then I ask each person what they've learned about themselves while being in relationship with their partner or spouse. We're going to have to modify that for you. So you can take this in any direction you'd prefer, but two options are what is something you've learned about yourself while being in relationship? And also perhaps what is something you've learned about yourself while specifically being single after having some number of relationships? So I want to start with what have I learned from the connections and relationships that I have been in because it's, it's been so profound for me to be in um, relationships with women as I've gone on this healing journey with working through my own, you know, uh, childhood experiences. Something that I've learned is that women can be safe. And that was a, t to share my authentic truth with a woman and to share my heart with a woman and to be vulnerable that it can be met with safety and love. And that was a huge thing for me to, because I didn't believe that to be true. I didn't experience that to be true throughout my whole life. Um, and to learn that it is safe was a beautiful uh, transformational experience for me. And through that process, what I've, by having that mirroring experience of, you know, being more authentic myself and embodying more of who I am, and having that reflected, appreciated, cherished by the people that I've chosen to be in connection with, I've learned about who I am as a human being because it's within connection that I come alive the most. It's in connection that my spontaneous nature, my playfulness, my sense of humor comes out. So I've learned so much about who I am and what I'm capable of by being in connection. And, um, so it feels like connection and relationships have been the the place where I've grown the most, learned the most about who I am and who I want to be as well. 
uh, including the places where um, my childhood experiences are still or have still played out and the places where I'm abandoning myself, where I'm doing something because I feel like I need to do that in order to be appreciated and loved and noticing those things that's happened in relationship. And so it's teaching me more about, you know, where there's still parts of me that don't fully embody my value and my worth. And so it's taught me that. It's taught me about uh, what else I can do to grow, to feel even more whole in myself as I am. May it be true for everyone. It's certainly possible. If someone wants to follow you, work with you, otherwise find you, there'll be links in the show notes, but anything you'd like to say? Yeah, if anyone resonates with what I'm sharing or can relate to any of those experiences, feel free to reach out to me personally. I do offer one-on-one coaching uh, to people to support them with this stuff. And I also have a course that's coming out soon in a few weeks. Uh, And that's um, a three-month course where we go deep into all these different topics, including uh, you know communication and having those collaborative conversations, understanding um, you know boundaries and how to have healthy boundaries that are heard and respected, and which enhance the intimacy rather than take away from the intimacy, and including those conversations around sex and how to move in to having more fulfilling sex through that emotional connection and emotional safety. So, yeah, um, if anyone is resonating with what I've shared, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. And thank you so much for bringing who you are to this conversation today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and please leave a rating and a review. And if you're ready to deepen your relationship and create a truly intimate, delicious, and vibrant marriage, head over to the Work With Me page at alexandrastockwell.com and choose the program that's right for you.